Hi, and welcome to the webinar. My name is Steve Ray, and we're going to talk today about the top mistakes that wine and spirit brands make when entering the U.S. market. Uh, we do a lot of work with export brands who want to come to the United States market, and we find that they all tend to make uh, a lot of common mistakes. And the goal of this webinar is to share those with you and some solutions to all of them so that you don't waste time, money, or resources and keep the momentum uh, for your brand introduction. So a little bit about me. My name is Steve Ray. I'm president of a company called Bevology. We're a marketing consulting company uh, based in New York. We specialize in helping wine and spirit companies enter and grow in the U.S. market. My personal background was that I started in, in the industry at uh, what is now Diageo and have uh, had my own marketing company for the last 15 years. Um, one of the functions that we provide for people is uh, to be an American guide or coach for exporters. And you'll see that come up in the first, uh, uh, the first mistake we're talking about. Uh, we also do a lot of brand development work, and that includes both creating uh, brands from scratch, if necessary, um, driving them uh, into the American market and getting all the pieces in place, managing them while uh, in the U.S. on behalf of the brand owners, and also consulting, uh, depending on what the needs of the clients are. We additionally do public relations, uh, both uh, trade and consumer, and the goal there is establishing and leveraging brand awareness uh, to support sales. And then lastly, we're very in, uh, involved in social media uh, and particularly engaging consumers and getting them to share your brand's story with their networks. So let's move right on to uh, uh, the subject at hand and that's lessons learned the hard way. And this is in 25 plus years of doing brand development work in the US market. And I think uh, one of my favorite quotes is this one, and I don't know who said it, but it was, experience is what you get when you don't get what you want. Um, kind of a wry comment, but think of these lessons as, as a mistake uh, that you can avoid making in the future. And if each one is worth $10,000, um, integrating what you've learned from this lecture can save you $140,000, hundreds of hours of staff time, and most importantly, it won't sap your momentum or undermine your credibility by making some of the same mistakes that people have made before you. So we'll go through the, the 14 mistakes uh, as a whole, and then we will talk about them individually. First one, trying to do it all by yourself versus having a guide. Second, thinking that the importer or distributor is going to build your brand for you. Uh, third is you need to have a proof of concept. Uh, they're not going to buy it on faith. Fourth, very common, people want to launch too big and expand too fast, and that is counterproductive uh, most often at the best of times. Fifth, finding an importer is not necessarily your first decision. It may be the one logical one you think of right away, but uh, you'll see why that doesn't make sense. Then comes not anticipating common objections. What we like to do is um, expect those objections. Uh, be prepared to answer them and actually undermine them so you preempt them from being asked in the first place. Seventh is not being familiar with the U.S. market, and part of the goal of this webinar is to educate you uh, on this part of the U.S. market. Eighth is brand ambassadors and the need for local market support, or feet on the street, as we call it. Uh, the importance of having a case history, real U.S. market success. People want to know that they're not a guinea pig. Uh, tenth, uh, a lot of times we see people not having a point of difference that makes a difference. They might have positioning for their brand, uh, and usually it would be consumer-oriented position, but it isn't necessarily a difference that makes a difference, and that, that's a critically important point. Eleventh is not having everything real and in place. When you're going to be talking to someone in the U.S., you need all your pieces in place, in inventory, all the point of sale printed, the website up, uh, everything working. Next one we find very common, uh, thinking that you can fund growth out of the profits generated by uh, the sales that you're making with your brand. And the simple answer there is that's not going to happen. And then lastly, thinking launch when you should be talking about a market test or introduction. And that may seem like semantics, but it makes a big difference in the way people perceive what it is you're trying to do and what your and their expectations are. So let's take it from the top and start off with the first one, trying to do it all yourself. 
We think the most important thing um, is to find and engage a guide. We do. There are other people out there that uh, perform the same function. But it's important that you make sure that you're talking to someone who not only has experience in the wine and spirits industry, that's an absolute mandatory, but also deep expand, uh, experience managing import brand introductions because while you may have experience in the market, if you've only worked with domestic brands, you haven't faced some of the challenges that imports uh, face, uh, and you really need to know those specifics, uh, again, to avoid mistakes. So big lesson learned as we go through this presentation, these are going to be in red on the bottom of every slide, that the guide can help you avoid doing the wrong things, which you may not know are wrong, or even if you do have the right things in the plan, if they're being done in the wrong order, that can hurt you as well. Second, thinking that the importer or distributor will build your brand for you. And the, the simple truth is it's not going to happen. They have their hands full with current suppliers and business. Um, they expect you to do all the heavy lifting and all the uh, footwork and groundwork to get your brand off to a strong start. And it's also important that you set realistic expectations. So we've had people come in and say, oh, I want to do 100,000 cases of vodka in the first year. Not going to happen. Or I'm going to, I want to do 80,000 bottles of wine in the first year. Probably not going to happen. So if you set expectations that are achievable, you are more likely to have people satisfied with the performance rather than disappointed with it. And uh, lastly, to commit to providing the resources and staff to drive distribution and sell through. And by that we mean, we'll talk more about that in a second, but the brand ambassadors that you have to have the people programs in place that are going to get consumers into stores, shopping, and buying your product, that you cannot rely on the importer or distributor to do it. While it might be nice and you'd like to think that they're going to do it for you, uh, we see this is a very common mistake uh, exporters make. So at the end of the day, uh, the, the simple fact is building the brand is your responsibility. Next one is proof of concept. Um, and I gave you the, <laughs> the conclusion there before we got to the, the rationale behind it, which I'll put up, that recognize importers and distributors want to minimize the risk that they're taking. So your task as a brand owner is to demonstrate that the brand has been successful, that you've established traction in the market, and that you're selling through to consumers, that you're generating repeat orders at retail. And the way I like to express it is by saying it's all about replacements, not placements. So a perfect example of this is if you're talking to an importer and they say, yes, we'll start with a distribution drive, we're going to get you into 200 accounts with one bottle placements, run away as fast as you can because that's just a recipe for disaster. The reality is you're much better off being in a limited number of accounts and doing really well there and depleting at a, you know, a case a month or two cases a month than being in 200 accounts where the bottle just sits on the shelf. Okay, another one, uh, launching too big and expanding too fast. Uh, the phrasing that a friend of ours once said at a seminar was, don't try and paint the states, meaning make the same solution apply to each state. And, and the reason is the U.S. is uh, composed of 52 different markets. There's 50 individual states, plus you have Washington, D.C. and Montgomery County, Maryland um, as independent regulatory entities. And so each one of them, it's like having 52 different countries, and you have to understand the rules of each. So just because you may want to be in New York and California, they are fundamentally as different as uh, Sweden is from Germany. Focus your resources on a limited number of accounts in a limited number of markets. Um, I had mentioned that. Really, the number of accounts that you can support. If you have a brand ambassador, the realistic number is you're probably going to be somewhere between 40 and 80 accounts that they can support well. Any more than that, uh, they're not going to be able to go into the account on a frequent basis. The account's going to feel ignored. The product doesn't sell through, and it's not going to get reordered. So it also uh, makes sense to focus and pick markets based on those that have similar structure so that you can amortize your resources across them. Case in point, if you're focusing on grocery markets, California, Chicago uh, are two markets where grocery is an important uh, method of distribution. 
absolutely not the case in New York. And so picking California and New York calls for two completely different set of strategies and programs. And that's not necessarily the most efficient way to approach the market. And the fifth one, um, a lot of people come and they say, well, the, the first thing I've got to do is to find an importer. And, and our recommendation to them is, you know, what you really want to do is maximize your flexibility and postpone long-term commitments. So you're better off starting with what we would call a service importer. Examples are MHW, uh, Park Street uh, Imports, uh, TL and Tenney, and there's a couple of others out there as well. And that's basically because they're going to say yes to most brands. That's what they do. And you're basically leasing them and you're only paying them for the services that you use. And that in turn frees up money, call it importer margin, that you can then apply to investing in the market, doing more strategic things to and move through in the accounts where you have distribution. So when people come to us and say, I'm looking for an importer in South Carolina, generally speaking, that's not the case. Uh, what you really need is an import solution for the United States that may cover uh, North or South Carolina, and then go on further to be looking for distributors in individual states. Two separate questions there. The next one, anticipate objections and preempt them before they are raised. This is one we, I guess, learn the hard way and also the fun way because we found out when it works, it's, it's the most effective strategy for launch, uh, introducing a brand in the United States. And some of the objections, just some of maybe the hundred that we hear, and I'll read them to you. It won't sell in my market or my bar or my restaurant or my hotel. I'm not going to be a guinea pig for you. Uh, your product is too expensive. I've tried that category before and it just doesn't sell in my store. And one of the more compelling ones is I don't have an account with your distributor. Therefore, I'm not going to buy it. And by the way, I have no interest in filling out a credit app with a new distributor because I got all the products I need. And the last two, I think, uh, are really important as well. And, and really, they're my two favorites. First one is when someone asks for it, I'll put it in. And the reality is most off-premise accounts aren't working the registers, don't hear the consumers coming in. So we like to recommend that people do programs that essentially waves a piece of paper or makes notice to the retailer that they have to recognize later when they're checking out the register, closing the register and so forth, that, hey, new customers have come, have come in and they've been driven by brand X. And the other one is you're not listed in the beverage journal for 750. Beverage Media publishes a book in about, I think it's uh, 29 states in the United States. This one happens to be for New York. And in New York, which is called a price posting state, Every brand for sale has to be posted by the fifth of the month, and it would appear in beverage media if your distributor is taking an ad. So basically, on and off-premise retailers, look in that book. And if you're not in the book, you don't exist in the market. You, you may be in the market, but if you're not in their list of products that people can buy, you effectively don't exist. There's another supplier that's come into the market called 750, S-E-V-E-N-F-I-F-T-Y. And that's purely an electronic one. And that's been really growing and establishing credibility as a place where more boutique uh, craft brands are or not the big um, international marketing companies like Diageo, uh, Pernod, Brown Foreman, and so forth. Well, they're there. But generally speaking, you can put your brand in 750 pretty easily um, and do your price posting in New York through them as well. Uh, the next one I think is perhaps the most important. I think many of them are the most important. This one is learn the U.S. system. Um, and one tool that I recommend is this is a picture of the book. It's, it's called The Exporter's Handbook to the U.S. Wine Market, written by Deborah Gray. And it's a handbook of all the answers to the questions that you probably never thought of asking and would really like to have the answer to at your fingertips when you're about to make one of these top 14 mistakes. So the, the trade is going to test you. They're going to ask you questions 
to determine whether you get it or not, whether you understand the U.S. market. And you need to be prepared so that those questions don't surprise you. So when they ask you, as they often will, do you know what a franchise state is? And you say, oh, you mean like McDonald's? You just killed your chance of, of talking further with that guy because that's specifically not what he's interested in or she. So spend your time to invest your time to get educated in the U.S. market. Read that book. I would also recommend that you watch um, all of the video, watch the videos and access or look through all of the articles that are posted on BTN. You can also find webinars, presentations, and articles on my site, www.bevologyinc.com. Uh, that would be of help. And what I put in here are specific links to where you can buy the board and bench, I mean, buy the um, the book, uh, watch the presentations on my site, as I said. And the other one I think is really, really valuable to you. You can see this on my site as well. This is a list of all the industry newsletters. And we highly recommend that all of our clients sign up for those. Most of them are free, a couple of them charge, but it's worth it. Because that's going to give you the thing, put your finger on the pulse of what's happening in the U.S. and get you familiar not only with the jargon, but the people's names, what's happening with distributor consolidation, and so on and so forth. And you will be more of the system, and you will pass the test that I referred to above to determine whether or not you get it. And then uh, another one also posted both on my site and also on uh, BTN's YouTube channel is to understand price structures. And there's a webinar there, and I also have available a Excel spreadsheet that has a very simple formula for starting with an Excel um, Exceller price in euros and converting it to dollars and then working your way through margin at both the uh, uh, importer, distributor, and on and off premise retailer level. If you're interested in that, send me an email. My email's at the, at the end of this presentation. Be happy to send the uh, spreadsheet to you. Number eight, uh, we talked a little bit about brand ambassadors and feet on the street. Um, they have many diff different names, brand ambassadors, market managers, sales representatives, and basically what their function is, not pretty girls working a presentation table. That's important, and some people call brand ambassadors that, but what this lady is doing right here is sampling the owner on the product in part of the selling process. She effectively is doing the importer and distributor's job for them because, frankly, the importer and distributor aren't going to do it for you. So you need to put the people on the street. There's many solutions to that. Spirits is a little bit easier, can afford uh, to pay for a brand ambassador. There's a number of uh, suppliers that are emerging now that are allowing you to lease uh, parts of them in individual markets. But you can't start selling to the consumers until you get into distribution, and you're not going to get distribution unless you drive it yourself because the uh, initial support that you're going to get from both the importer and the distributor is probably not going to be sufficient. Be well-intentioned, but it's, they're not going to put the level of a, uh, attention to it and detail that you yourself would. So some of the programs that you're going to want them to do, focus the biggest one off-premise is in-store tastings. We know it works. When you put a sample of your product in people's mouths and tell them about it, there's a significantly better chance that you're going to be able to sell that product and close the sale. Wine by the Glass programs is a nice parallel in the on-premise, again, to get people sampling and tasting it um, for retailers and, and, and restaurant accounts as well to set up seminars and dinners with your best customers. And those are things that either your wine specialist or spirit specialist can speak at. Sometimes the importer can allocate people. Sometimes the distributor can allocate people. But what it does is um, uh, favor your best customers and give them a little more hands-on connection with the brands that you sell. And, and, and that could be a significant boon both to independent uh, wine and spirit shops as well as um, on-premise accounts. And be creative in helping them grow their business. Um, think about it from their perspective. They don't really care about your brand. What they're interested in is getting more customers, spending more, referring their customers' friends, and getting those people to shop or dine more frequently. That's how they make money. Your brand is just one tool that they have to facilitate that. But it's not their objective. Um, it's yours. Their objectives are what I've cited here. So the distributor expects you to get the initial set of accounts before they'll make any, any efforts. And you'll see as we go forward that the 
better you're able to develop a case history that shows your brand is successful, the easier it's going to be to get those initial sales and make that scale up into uh, uh, movement in the, in the uh, U.S. market. So we talk about show me, okay, and that's really what I'm talking about here is to prove that your concept works in commercial distribution so that you can get real commercial distribution. And that may sound like uh, a non sequitur, but the reality is you need to prove the brand is successful so that other people will say, oh, if it was successful there, I can be, it can be successful for me. And then you can make it successful in the broader market. So when we talk about the number of accounts, you need enough to matter, but not too many to handle. And as I say, depending on what the split is and what the market is like, 40 to 80 per market is probably reasonable. I think the, up uh, the upside potential of a brand ambassador a fully loaded one would be 100 accounts, but recognize that uh, 30 to 40 of those accounts are not going to get anywhere near the attention uh, that the top uh, 50, 60 do. Um, I talked a little bit about building a case study with reference accounts and retailers and on-premise operators who they look up to and they follow. If you show an example, and we're going to show one in a little bit, of what KL does, which is one of the major retailers, very small stores, but a significant presence on the West Coast, They're, the guys in New York are going to stand up and take notice because while it isn't in the New York market, KL has a reputation. Better yet, make it successful at 67 wine in New York and you'll make more of an impact. Use trade PR to promote it. It's one thing to generate the success and have the brand selling well, but you got to let people know that that's happening. So trade PR is an absolutely critical and uh, critical piece of the, of the equation that you have to put into place. It's not discretionary. Trade marketing to sell the sizzle of your success is a critical part of your marketing program. And it all boils down to this. The goal, your goal, is to get them to discover their brand or think they did, and then proactively ask you to ask you for it. And I'm going to show you an example in the next three slides, which is a very elegant way that uh, it worked for us. Um, and the, the product in this case is called Singani 63. And uh, as is often the case with some of the brands that I worked with, this was a product that people never heard of the brand, they never heard of the category, they never heard of the country. It's from Bolivia. They never heard of the company, and they never heard of the distributor. Well, that's going to make it pretty challenging for us to get distribution, right? Well, um, one of our brand ambassadors, I, one of it was actually my daughter who was working in uh, Southern California, uh, connected with the guy who writes a blog for KNL. This is this important um, three accounts: two in LA. I'm sorry, uh, two in San Francisco, one in LA. But the guy who was most interested writes a blog. And we asked him, what are you interested in? And he said, what I really want is an interview with the guy behind the product. In this case, we had a celebrity in help. Uh, his name was Steven, is Steven Soderbergh, the film director. It's not like he's, you know, George Clooney or uh, Brad Pitt or people like that. But still in all, you know, he had, he had some um, uh, momentum. This is the article that ran. Uh, it was quite a bit longer than that, but obviously has Stephen and it tells the whole story um, in in all its gory detail about mistakes that he he's made, the lessons that he learned from me helping him as a guide. And um, the article ran, published at 9 p.m. I think it was on a Tuesday night. By 11 a.m. the next day, they had sold through all 11 cases that we had uh, initially put in, 12 bottle cases. That's really astonishing for a new brand that. Nobody has ever heard of the, of the brand category country or, or whatever. And Singani, by the way, is a clear brandy made from Muscat of Alexandria grapes grown in the high Andes in Bolivia in South America. It's, they've been making it for 500 years, but it's never been exported, not even to their adjacent countries of Chile or Peru or Argentina or Brazil. So KNL ordered another 11 cases. They sold those out in two days. They ordered another 50 cases. Unfortunately, we only had uh, 40 cases in stock in the state. I, I had not anticipated that, and that's a big lesson that you need to learn. And in fact, some of that stock was at a warehouse so that we had to physically get in a car, drive to the warehouse, pick up the inventory, and deliver it because that particular warehouse didn't deliver 
uh, on the day that we needed to get it to this guy. So you have to be willing to do stuff like that. Lessons learned there. Focus your com consumer communications only on those who connect. Here's some of the numbers. That KNL newsletter goes out to 90,000 people. And pretty much every recipient of that newsletter is a customer of KNL. So while it's mass communications, you're only spending your money. In this case, we didn't spend any money at all. In fact, I promised to take him out to dinner, and I, I still have yet to do that two years later. Not Stephen, but to take the uh, retailer out to dinner. But the, the, the brilliance of it was we're only investing our time, resources, and attention on the people who can actually buy the product. And since KNL is a big e-commerce retailer, that means that about 30 other states, people in 30 other states where we don't even have physical distribution can actually buy the product, which is pretty exciting as well. And the second piece of that is word of mouth and the equivalent of word of mouth, whether it's social media, whether it's shares and comments on Facebook or it's Twitter or Instagram posts, is much more powerful than you doing the shouting. When person X tells his network of 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000 people that they discovered this interesting new product that is so much more powerful than any ad you can put in Wine Spectator or, uh, or even you know, running a, a Facebook ad uh, online. But that's not all, as we like to say in America. Okay, we leveraged that success in California with a trade ad. <clears throat> and the interesting thing was the trade ad had a target audience of only four people. In the U.S., the people who make the decisions on whether or not, uh, at the distributor level, uh, whether or not to take in a brand are the general managers of that distributor house in that state. So you may be dealing with the corporate marketing VP in New York for a chain, oh, and for a distributor that has operations in 29 states, but what you really need to be doing is talking to those 29 general managers because the guy in New York cannot dictate to the individual states uh, what brands to take. So if you, in this case, we knew we had four people. Uh, we knew who those four people were. And we came up with this uh, idea on a way to reach them. We did this ad. And actually, in this case, it was wonderful because here I had a Hollywood film director who was both my copywriter, photographer, uh, and uh, creative director. And we developed this ad. And it was really an advertisement. And you can see, I think I can do this here. Uh, you can see right here where it says ad advertorial. And it, it was a very, you know, funny story, very tongue in cheek. Stephen is very, uh, uh, has very sarcastic wit. And it, it certainly was, was his voice that was coming out. What happened was, uh, in, the, in the case of the first person we were talking to, we scheduled in, in the beverage media ad that came out on a Wednesday, and we scheduled the meeting with the general manager on the Thursday so that we knew that when we walked into the meeting with the guy, he will have seen that ad the day before. And indeed, he did do that. He walked in with the magazine open, put, the, uh, uh, put it down in front of us with the ad showing and said, I'm taking the brand. Now let's talk. And I got to tell you, that's never happened to me before. On the West Coast, it was just as interesting. Uh, we didn't have the timing as precise as that. But because the ad looks a little like an editorial piece, uh, one of the guys I wanted to talk to tore the ad out of the magazine, scanned it, pasted it, embedded it in his email, and sent it to me and said, I've been reading about your brand and would like to talk to you about carrying it. Now, think about how much easier it is for me now to work with those GMs who have already indicated an interest. All of the objections that we talked about three or four slides ago never got raised. They never had any objections whatsoever because they had already sold themselves. And this becomes the strategy that, that we know works. And uh, I'm not saying that you need to do it this exact way. This way worked for Singani 63. But I would take the same strategies but execute them differently for individual brands, wine brands in particular. I like to say that you need to have a point of difference that makes a difference. Um, and the one way to think about it is if your point of difference does make a difference, but it doesn't make someone laugh or cry, hey, baby pictures, you got to have baby pictures in a PowerPoint. It's not a real PowerPoint without it. Uh, then you know it's working. If they're not um, laughing or crying, you might have to rethink it. Uh, it may be a little too uh, prosaic. So 
think about it this way. You want to make sure that your brand proposition is authentic, unique, and motivating. And each one of those words is really, really important. Authentic because we know that's what motivates millennials. They want to know that there's a real story that it's not anything that's constructed. In the case of Singani, it had a 500-year-old history. That's a fact that they can discover, and we planted that for them to discover along the way. That's unique. It has got to be somehow different. And I, I don't care if your brand is a Sagrantino de Montefalco or if it's a Sauvignon Blanc from Marlboro. Your wine, your spirit made from the, the wheat that it's produced from or the land that it's produced is going to be different from everybody else's, even if they're your next door neighbor. You have a unique story. You have to learn and figure out how to tell that story uh, in a unique way as well. And the last point about it being motivated, you want people to take some action, do something, whether it's click on this button, share it, uh, like your uh, page on Facebook, ask for uh, a link to an article or get a promotional item, make them do something, ideally share it with their friends. Next thing, as I said, it's all about discovery and sharing. Uh, people are much more interested in sharing something when they feel that they've discovered it themselves. Um, and I'll give you a little hint uh, because this hasn't happened yet, but maybe those of you watching will be the ones that it happens to. If you go to the Singani 63 website and read the terms and conditions and the privacy policy, I think you'll be very surprised. Uh, while I originally wrote it in a very dry, legal, approved way, Stephen rewrote it. And it's, again, very much his personality. But it's there to be discovered by the consumer when they go to that thing. And when they do, they're going to go, wow. this!" Brand. I mean, he spent an entire weekend to rewrite the copy for that. So what can you do similar to that to plant the seeds for people to discover something that, that's going to make them joyous when they discovered about your brand? It doesn't have to be terms and conditions or privacy policy, but it has to be something that's unique and specific to your product, your place, your brand. Um, third piece of that is to build into your program ways for people who have had the chance to taste it to become evangelists for you in their network. And that's where the real power of multiplication comes. If you think about it, for every one person you might be able to get come to your website, you might be able to reach 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 within their, oh, by them sharing it with their networks. Let me give you an example. Wine spectator circulation in the U.S. is 400,000. Vivino, which is a wine app, uh, has a circulation or has been downloaded 16 million times. That's two, if not three orders of magnitude larger. So the real strategy here is put your message don't make your customers come to you or your prospects. Go where they're already gathered. Another often fatal mistake is this one, intro before you're ready. I like to say you're not ready for prime time if you don't have everything already in place. Uh, the liquid's got to be in the bottle. The labels are on. The inventory is in the United States. Of course, the label has been improved, approved. The marketing is done. The point of sale is printed. Everything is ready to go. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've walked into uh, a importer presentation and I had a, a, a Lucite bottle, a, a prototypical bottle, and it was the only one that was in existence. And they said, can you leave that with us? And the answer is no. You, you might as well just shoot yourself in the head because you just said, we're not ready yet. So if you're not ready yet, you shouldn't be talking to those guys because they're ready to go as soon as if you make a compelling story. Okay. Think also about the fact that they're looking for a reason to say no. So don't give it to them. And you have this in your power to know all of the objections you're going to get, to know all the mistakes that everybody made. Well, maybe not all of them, but 14 of the biggest ones that uh, everybody made before you. So don't make the same mistakes that they did. Um, I'd like to say be creative, be innovative, make your own mistakes, because oftentimes maybe those aren't really mistakes, they're opportunities. So some of the signals that you're not ready, I mentioned about the sample bottle, um, a website, for example, that's not live. Oh, we're going to be, it's coming online in three weeks. It's either ready or not. If it's not ready, it doesn't exist, okay? Or point of sale, neck hangers, shelf talkers, those things are, are not printed yet. Uh, if you come in showing layouts or comps, comprehensive renderings of what it's going to look like, once again, um, you're basically telling the guy or woman that you're not ready and you don't want to do that. This 
This is a, a big one. I mentioned this when I, I did the initial review there. Thinking that you can fund growth out of profits. And the reality is really simple. You can't. It's not going to work. Um, a lot of people get very disappointed because they, they thought, well, you know, I don't have any other investment way to, I, I can't get $5 million, 500000 to 50000 whatever it's going to take uh, to support my brand. Well, if that's the case, then maybe you shouldn't be introducing it because the reality in the marketplace is you cannot fund growth out of profits. You need to, uh, you need to reinvest that money. Uh, well, I'm sorry, you need to invest other money. You, it's a capital absorbing business, okay? So acknowledge that upfront, plan to invest ahead of volume and certainly ahead of profitability. And the goal is to establish belief among the people that you're working with that the brand has traction and credibility. If you get them thinking it's moving, like the guy in California and the guy in New York that I was talking about, um, uh, you're going to change the whole equation and change the way that people are looking at you. Instead of looking like this when you come into the office, they're going to be, tell me about your brand and be very interested. So don't give them a reason to say no. All they need is one and you're done. Okay. So as I said, thinking you can fund growth out of profits, simply put, you can't. It won't work. 13, not thinking the whole thing through from the beginning. And while we often talk with people who say they have, oh, yeah, they've done the marketing plan and all that kind of stuff, but frankly, they really haven't. They may have thought about it, but they haven't really thought through everything in all the detail with all the objections that might be raised and all the mistakes that might happen and what can throw you off track. You have to be able to get thrown off track and be able to keep going. Um, so I'd like to, to, to say that there are five strategic decisions that are key that you need to think about before you're really ready to even start putting your plans together, okay? And if you answer these questions, then you'll be able to do things in the right order, ask the right questions, and make the right decisions. And the first one is um, recognize that you may need an importer, but you don't need your long-term solution for an importer to start, that you can use MHW or Park Street or some of these service importers, lease them as I said, uh, because they'll basically say yes to everybody. So if your problem is finding an importer, that's solved. That's an easy solution. It's not the importer you want and it's not the solution that you want long term, but it's a way to get started and get to yes. So don't let the first obstacle stop you in your track. Second one, you also need a distribution solution. Quite often, the distribution solution comes along with the importer solution. If you end up working with an importer, they already have an established distribu distributor network, and that would be the first place that they would be pitching your brand. But even in the case of Park Street and MHW, uh, they both have distribution licenses in New York, New Jersey, and Florida, and effectively in California, because you can self-distribute in California. So you've got your second one solved as well. Again, not the solution you necessarily wanted and not the long-term solution, but you've turned a problem that was an obstacle into an opportunity. The third one is the sales solution. And you have to recognize that there are a couple of pieces of this. One is there's somebody at a senior level who's going to be dealing with senior distributor staff to actually sell the product in and say, yeah, you guys ought to carry that brand. And then you're going to need somebody, it can be the same person, sometimes it's not, to be the sales manager that works with the line managers and street sales to make sure that things get executed on the street. Incentives are put in place, uh, distribution drives are done, sampling programs, uh, in-store tastings, all that stuff. The fourth one is make sure you know specifically, not that you're going to drive traffic and repeat purchase in the on and off premise, that that's your objective, but how you're going to do that. What are the programs? What are the tools that you're going to use? And how effective are, are they going to be? And how do you know that they're going to be effective? And are they focused on the things that really matter? Um, and that only comes from experience. And the fifth one is promotion. Um, as I said, you need feet on the street, a brand ambassador solution, or something that approximates that local market support that's going to help make sure the product gets into the stores and restaurants um, and gets pulled through. So yes, they're doing the job for the distributor, job of the distributor for the distributor, only you're paying for it. That's the way the market works and you just have to accept that. 
And the last one, it's not part of the five strategic ones, but it actually comes before that, and that is, what is your exit strategy? If your plan for your brand is to flip it, make it, grow it to 50,000 cases and flip it to Diageo or Pernod or somebody else for $150 million or to Constellation as the prisoner did a couple of weeks ago for $280 million for uh, a red blend selling at $35 a bottle, uh, which by the way, does not even have a winery or a production facility or vineyards, um, that's gonna influence your exit strategy will influence a lot of the decisions that you make and how you invest your money. So you really need to think through that and not just think through it yourself. You really need to do it with a guide who can help, who can ask you the hard questions um, that really are uh, what we would call uh, softball questions uh, that you're going to get asked hardball ones from the real trade. And then last, think market test or introduction, not launch. And this may sound, as I said, it may sound like semantics, but, but it's really, really important because the word launch carries baggage. It says you have this arrogance, this hubris, that you've got everything worked out, tied with a bow, you're ready for delivery. And the reality is we know from having done this 50, 60, 100 times, if you get 50% of it right, you're doing really, really good. You know, in American baseball, we have hitting averages and a really fabulous hitter is over th is just about 300. That's one in three, okay? If, if, if you get 50% right, you're doing really good in America. Also, um, launch implies that you're not going to be receptive to their ideas, adapting to change, evolving, or reacting and responding to the things that happen on the street. Again, that's sort of a kiss of death because if you're that arrogant that you think you have all the answers and they know you don't because for every brand that we've seen succeed, there's probably a hundred that have failed by doing one or more of these 14 uh, mistakes or others as well. Um, so when you say market test or you say introduction, you're communicating the fact that you're not so arrogant that you're willing to adapt and address the changes in the market, that, that you're going to monitor results, react to re reality, and not only are you willing, you're prepared, you're ready to make changes. Again, it changes their attitudes towards you and make them much more receptive or less negative when you go and uh, present to them. The other thing it does is it allows you to establish benchmark metrics rather than declare them. So for example, uh, you can calculate or through a test market establish conversion ratios for tastings and the velocity of sale or frequency of reorders at retail or on premise that are right for your brand. I might tell you, well, the general number we look to is 30% uh, closure rate from sales when you're doing an off premise tasting. Well, if you have a product that's like Jägermeister and it's not going to taste good to a lot of people, that may not be the right number for your brand. Or if you're selling a sweet wine and the market is, uh, there's much smaller incidence of sweet wine drinkers in America than dry wine drinkers. And off premise, off premise, you want them thinking floor displays rather than a permanent shelf placement. A lot of people come in and say, well, I'm just looking for one placement on the shelf. Actually, you, you don't want that. I, I, I would be very happy to get a three or five case floor display and nothing on the shelf so that I could really move some inventory that the, um, the account operator is going to recognize and realize is significant to them than having one get lost on the shelf and he'll never recognize when it actually turns. So the 14th one, as I said, is think market test or introduction. Uh, a little humility goes a long way and those words work better than launch. So we've covered a lot of ground. I'm just going to review the 14 um, as a top line now. Uh, I would urge you to, uh, you'll be able, I've got a link to my, you can send me an email and we'll send you a PDF uh, of this so that you don't have to take notes. I should have said that in the beginning. I apologize. So here's what we talked about. One, find a guide. You absolutely need to somebody to think that you're going to do this without having somebody who lives, operates, and is thoroughly experienced in the U.S. market is the most common and probably the worst mistake uh, that we see people make. Second, building the brand is your responsibility. You need to recognize that the importer distributor is not going to do it for you. Third, you need to prove the concept and think about it in terms of it's not about getting placements for your brand, but is it turning at retail? So think 
replacements, not placements. Don't launch too big or expand too fast to try and paint the stage. Start small in a market where you can control that. Don't be looking for volume right away. What you want is traction. You want velocity. You want the trade to think that it's successful, and then you're going to roll out your public relations to let them know that that's the case. Okay? When you make your decisions about importers and distributors, maximize your flexibility, postpone long-term commitments until you are in a better position to negotiate. To negotiate at this point in time when you're first launching with an importer means they're controlling the negotiations and you're going to get a pretty lousy deal. But if you wait until they call you, all of a sudden, now you're negotiating from a point of equality. Anticipate objections and preempt them before they're asked. This is nothing new to the wine and spirits industry. It's been true in the sales business forever and ever. And that is understand your customer, why they buy, why they say no, have the answers to all those, and answer them before they ever get asked. Then they never get asked, OK? Invest your time and energy to learn the rules so that then you can figure out how to bend them. And there's a million places to find this information, starting with Deb's book, watching my webinars, looking at the content that's on BTN, going to conferences like the USA Trade Tasting in, in uh, New York, uh, and some of the other international conferences, conferences that I speak at, where I talk about a lot of this stuff, and we show some practical examples. OK, number eight. The distributor expects you to get the initial set of accounts before they're actually going to start. So when, when you're, if you're introducing and you already have 80 accounts in New York and their top mixology bars or their Cherry Lehman or uh, you know, some of the top uh, off-premise accounts, on-premise accounts like the Danny Meyer group, imagine the power that you'll have when you sit down and talk with that distributor and say, I already have all these accounts and in fact, we can just turn them over to you. They're already earning incentives for your distributor sales staff. Believe me, the distributor sales staff is going to love having you dump some really, really great accounts into their bucket without them having to do any work. The strategy, um, work it through so that you get importers and distributors to proactively call you. It's not enough to just say, I need an importer to sell my brand. You need to close the loop and get them to call you so that you can say, well, maybe I'll take your call. And yes, I'll be there. Have a point of difference that makes a difference. I can't stress this strongly enough. A lot of people have a point of difference, but more often than not, it doesn't make a difference to anybody except them. And oftentimes, not even that. It's got to be something that, that uh, means something to your target audience and that motivates them to do something. And um, just back up to that point. Those points of differences, you need to have two. One is oriented to the importer distributor. They're interested in money and margin and uh, the marketing support that you're going to put behind it and so on and so forth. They really don't care about whether your grandfather purchased the land 20 years ago or 200 years ago or uh, any of those historic stories. Those are wonderful for consumers, but for the trade, they want an economic story. For the consumer, they want a uh, emotional story. Don't introduce until you have all the elements in place. It's very, you, you know, you tend to set up hard deadlines that are only your deadlines and not necessarily real deadlines. And if you hold yourself to those deadlines to the point that you're talking to importers and distributors before you have all your tools in place, then you're closing the door before you even knock on it. Uh, I said you can't fund growth out of profits. Um, that you need to think through everything before you act, including your exit strategy. And lastly, as I said, think market test or introduction, not launch, and think humility. I mean, at the end of the day, the trade are the gatekeepers. They're the ones that are going to determine your success or failures. So you need to go to them with a level of humility and an openness uh, so that they're willing to take a chance on you because you're different from the 100 other guys that called them this week. And think about that. They may get 100 calls a week. They may take 10 of those phone calls. They may take only one of those meetings. And of those one meetings, maybe only 10% of those brands. So think your way through that and make sure your calls get answered, the meetings take place, and you're giving them something that they recognize that they're going to be able to make money on, because that's what they're interested in. So as I said, thank you very much for your
time. I appreciate it. Uh, if you write me at steve at bevologyinc.com, be happy to send you a PDF of this PowerPoint. And as I said, if you go to uh, www.bevologyinc.com, presentations and blog, you'll find a wealth of information there. Again, which I share freely. Uh, and uh, my goal is that every one of you who's listening here, please do not make the same mistakes again that those who came before you make. I'd much rather see you make creative, innovative, uh, let's call it bending the rules as opposed to mistakes, so that you can uh, launch your brand and be successful in America. Thank you very much.